This, this time of year is always a very interesting time of year, especially for our students, because it's graduation season, right? Uh, parents, grandparents, you know what that means, is that you as, as parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, friends, you get to go sit in graduation ceremonies, which are great and amazing, and we all love every second that we spend in a graduation ceremony. I hope you can pick up on a little bit of the sarcasm in my voice. Graduation ceremonies are awesome. There, there's, a, there's a lot of wonderful things, and there's also a lot of crosses when graduation ceremonies. The biggest, most wonderful thing is that everybody that we are there to support, they get their moment in the spotlight. John David Mathern, barely passing, congratulations, and you walk across the stage, you get your diploma, photo op, you walk a little bit further, you either got to move the tassel or get your hood or whatever it is next, photo op, and then you walk off the stage and there's a couple little, there's always a couple of road clappers, there's always that one family that's real excited for that one person, that was my mother, right? Like it's always, in graduation ceremonies, everybody gets their moment in the spotlight and it's wonderful. I remember being in my, I've now graduated from high school, graduated from college, I graduated from seminary, from, from grad school, um, and all of them, I've always felt the same way sitting in the uncomfortable chair in the gym, or, or in, the, in the hall, or wherever it is, I've always felt the same way. As the person graduating, I've always had a watch on, and I'm just watching it. Because when are these people going to stop speaking? It's always the same thing. The principal, president of the university, whoever it is, there's always the same speech that's given. Congratulations, you made it. It was really hard. Now go change the world. Right? That's kind of the, that's kind of the general arc, if you will, of a graduation speech. Congratulations, you made it. It was really hard. Go change the world. Right? It's the same art. The president of the university, the principal, they get up and say it. They probably have a guest speaker. They get up and say it. It's all the same thing. Congratulations. You made it. It was pretty hard. Now go change the world. I think one of the reasons why I've, I've always had a struggle with that speech is because there's a call to action that n it doesn't really mean anything. There's a call to action that doesn't really mean anything. Congratulations, you made it. We, we can understand that. You just made it through however many hours or however many years of schooling. Congratulations. It was very hard. This year, especially if you're a senior that's graduating, congratulations, you made it. It was very hard. It was a different kind of world this year, right? Your last year and a half has basically been robbed and changed. It's completely different, but you made it. It was very hard. The, the part that doesn't make sense is, now go change the world. It's almost too broad. It's a call to action with no measurable response. And quite honestly, by the time everybody walks across the stage and gets their photo ops, by the time everything's over, by the time you sing the alma mater, throw the hat, say the Pledge of Allegiance, whatever it is that you do in these ceremonies, by the time you walk out, the only thing you're really worried about is getting something to eat, something to drink, and relaxing. Because you don't have to take any more finals. Go change the world. It's almost an empty command. It gets you excited, but there's nothing that you can actually do. And quite honestly, when we get excited about something and there's a call to action, but there is no action that takes place, it just becomes empty. Like, think about some of the greatest speeches, whether it be from movies or it be from real life. Like, think about some of the greatest speeches that have had calls to action. Very, very simple, clear calls to action. And imagine for a moment if there was no action that followed. One of my favorite movies is uh, Braveheart. And if you've seen Braveheart, you know William Wallace on the battlefield gets his troops all kind of fired up. They show up in the war paint. They're all excited. It, 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 like everybody gets fired up. You can't watch that. If you have a pulse, you cannot watch that and not get excited about going into battle with him. 
Because he's, command, he's a commanding presence. He pulls everybody together. He gets them all excited. And they're ready to go and fight. Just imagine if he does this whole thing. What will you do with this freedom? And at the end of the speech, no one moves. It would be a call to action with no response. Think of another famous speech, Martin Luther King, Jr. When he's standing, on, uh, when he's standing in Washington, D.C., and he has 250,000 people in front of him, and he gives his, his magnificent I Have a Dream speech, talking about racial equality and, ra and racial justice in our country that was struggling with it at the time, and it still echoes today, but like he was fighting with that, and he's speaking this truth, and he's saying, I, I want to see, I, I dream of a day that men will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, and he goes on this beautiful speech. Just imagine if all 250,000 people that were listening in person to this man speak would have just said, nice and went home. Nothing would have changed. It would have been a call to action without a response. Today in our first reading, I think Jesus Christ it gets confused for being a graduation speech. Because he's calling his disciples to action. And there's no response. Notice what happens. Jesus, this is, his final, this is his final time with his disciples. This is his final moments on earth. This is his final moments bodily before the men that he has walked with, the 12 that he has walked with, that he has formed, that he has continued to teach and to work with. 11, sorry, Judas is gone by this point. But he's with these 11, and he's teaching them. He's been walking with them. He's been forming them. He's been saying, I want you to continue this life. I want you to continue to build this church continue to preach this gospel and he ascends to heaven and this is what the first reading says while they were looking intently at the sky as he was going suddenly two men in white garments stood beside them they said men of Galilee why are you standing there looking at the sky? Jesus just told them the mystery of what he, the, the, the mission of what he wants them to do. He wants them to go out to proclaim the truth. He wants them to go and drive out demons. He wants them to be his presence, to work the same miracles that he did as we hear in the gospel. And they find themselves just standing there that's nice. There he goes. And he's gone. You could almost hear it in the question. The two men dressed in white, we, we assume they're angels. You could almost hear it in the question that they ask. Why are you standing there looking at the sky? He just told you what to do. Go. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus ascended into heaven. 40 days after the resurrection, he ascended into heaven. That's the celebration that we have today. But Jesus does not leave us alone. Next week, we celebrate Pentecost. Next week, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. But bodily, Jesus today steps away from creation. He ascends back into heaven. And we could stand there looking at the sky, not moving and just saying... That's nice. But that's not what God is calling us to do. You see, you and I are called to be Jesus' presence. While he might have ascended bodily into heaven, he commissions every one of us to be his presence in the world. He sends you and I by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of the sacraments that we receive, he comes to us in the sacraments and sends us out. And this command is not an empty promise that you might hear at a graduation ceremony. Congratulations, that was hard. Go and change the world. 
This command is, is the, by virtue of our baptism. This is Jesus saying, I want you to be me. Always and everywhere. I want where you go for people to know me better. I want people, when you go somewhere, when you say something, I want them to hear me and see me. St. Teresa of Avila has one of the most beautiful quotes I've ever heard about this. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body on earth but yours. When we hear something like that, I want to, I want to call out a temptation. When we hear something, uh, when we hear that image that you are his body, it's very easy for us to think, well, yeah, all of us. Not plural. I don't mean this in the plural. You, individually, if you're sitting in this church today, you are called to be Christ's body. To be his hands, his feet, his eyes, his mouth. You are called to be his presence wherever you find yourself. You. So often we can collect, we can, we can almost disengage ourselves from the mission that God is calling us to. Whether that be because, you know what, it's a lot more comfortable just to stare at the sky. Because, you know what, it might not be that important. It's not that big of a priority in my life. Like, Father, I got other things going on. Like, you said yes to the church to be a priest. You said yes to go and, like, preach the gospel and do all these things. And you said yes to celebrating the sacraments. That's your job. But in reality, it's all of our job. Every single one of us, by virtue of our baptism, hold the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Who do we share it with? Sometimes it can be that, it, you know what, I, like, I like, be, I, like, I remember being in college and thinking, you know what, I'm going to be the best Sunday Catholic ever. Like, Saturday, like, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to enjoy myself, I'm going to do my thing, I'm going to tailgate, I'm going to have, like, the life of debauchery and all these other things. But you know what, on Sunday, I'm going to be in the pew because I was raised to do that, and if not, my grandma won't feed me. But God's not calling us to be a Sunday Catholic. God's not calling us to pick up our faith when we walk in the door and to leave it in the pew on our way out. God's calling us to be Catholic, to live in a way that reflects his presence always and everywhere. C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If all of this Jesus stuff is wrong, pack it up, sell the church, and let's go home. But I got a feeling we don't believe that. His second part of his quote, he said, Christianity, if true, is of infinite importance. If Christianity, if what we believe, if what we profess in a few minutes in the creed, if we believe that it is true, then it is the most important of important things. Then he says, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. This faith that we profess, our reason for being here today, can't be Just one thing among many. Instead, it becomes the mission of our life to be God's presence to the rest of the world. Because the thing on the line is the most important of things. Salvation. For ourselves and for others. So why do we not just stand there looking at the sky Because the mission is way too important. 
I'll close with this. Uh, I remember the year before I entered the seminary, I worked at a summer camp in Texas. I've talked about this before. Um, it's a, it was a wonderful summer. I really enjoyed it. The first week that we were there, um, we had a training just for the staff. And what their plan was for the training was to just send us through an entire week of what we would typically do with the kids. So as we're going through the week, um, we were like playing the games and we were going through the different, uh, the different talks and we were kind of going through and the staff was kind of running it for us just so we can see kind of what the kids did. And we had a blast. Like, it was a great time. It was a bunch of college students. It was a bunch of us that were like, that we were, we wanted to, we were, we had volunteered to go to Big Sandy, Texas to work in the, in the borderline desert of East Texas and be with these kids. And it, it was a lot of fun. We had a great time, played Ultimate Frisbee. We, we had stupid games. Like, it, we had an absolute blast for the first week. And I remember getting to the end of that week. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't time for me to receive anymore. It was time for me to get my own cabin with my own kids and to be a counselor. And it took me about two days to adjust because I was having such a good time with everybody else, just consuming and enjoying. And now I have a group of, I have eight 10 year olds that have been handed to me and someone else that have boogers, they stink, and they like wet the bed. There's a reason why I'm a priest. I don't do that, right? Like, I don't do that. I don't deal with kids that do that. You know what I mean. But anyway, I remember sitting there and just wondering what the heck happened to such a wonderful week. What the heck happened? Like, I, I had such a good time with everybody, and now all of a sudden, it's not that. But it was my turn to help form. It was my turn to help to, to reflect the gospel. It was my turn, now having received all the good, to now go out and to share what, what, what I had received. I could have stayed there in that first week and just looked up at the sky. But that's not what God was calling me to do. God was calling me to go and walk with these kids. God doesn't stop. He, he was, he's been with us through Lent. He's been with us now through the Easter season. And now as he ascends into heaven and completes his mystery and his reason for coming, it's now not our time just to sit and reflect on what was. Now be sent and to go be the presence of Christ in the world. So today, as we come to receive communion, as we come to this Mass, we're not coming just to stare and to watch. Our faith is not a consumer sport. We're called now to leave from here, to go and to be God's presence, to go and to share the Gospel. Congratulations. The Christian journey is hard. Now it's our time, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go and change the world. Amen.